I've always been very surprised when people find my work varied. I always think that, yes, it is varied, but it's varied only in the subject matter. What lies underneath is always about mankind, about human condition. The idea that I take pictures of nature isn't true at all. All of my landscape are very, uh, um, are really honed to the, to the palm print of man, man's, man's effect on their surrounding. So when I photograph the landscape like in China or in um, Chernobyl or in Kazakhstan or Russia, it's, 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 it's really about the endeavor of man that's behind those pictures. And the portraiture is very much the same. I think a successful portrait is a portrait that asks as many questions as it answers. Also, if it's of a well-known person, that it's a view of that person that you're not that accustomed to. If it's a well-known actor or a celebrity, it's, it can almost prick that bubble, pop that bubble that they live in a sacred space, you know, of celebrityism, um, and that the human condition permeates everyone, that we are part of a whole. I do seek to humanize. I don't particularly seek to flatter, nor do the kind of subjects that I would photograph need that. We all go to the movies, we all go to the theatre, and we never go to watch people smiling. We go for drama, we go for real life sentiment. We find successful the portraits that at some level show us something that we already know because we recognize it as a feeling we've had ourselves. The thinking behind Bacon and the Sylvester interviews of Bacon um, have influenced me a lot. The idea that a turned away head or a distorted head can have so much more meaning for a viewer, can intrigue a viewer so much more to usher in parts of themselves into the experience is paramount for me. The turned away head, the, the back of the head, the distorted, the scream, the face being covered, all of that causes such a rise as a human condition in all humans. I think my starting point is always the same. I look up how people look. So I Google and I look at images, as many as I can. I'm looking at a face because I'm trying to see how I might imagine lighting that face. And I let that be intuitive, I just trust it. Is this going to be moody? Is it going to be from the left? Is it going to be quite flat? How do I see this person showing themselves to me on a piece of paper? And I go with that. And I trust it because I think that humans show a lot. I think your story has molded your face. And I trust my homework being the visual of a person's face is as important as learning if they have a, you know, a degree from Oxford or, or all the great things they might have done. Desmond Tutu is a great man, no doubt about. The Truth Commission is one of the greatest endeavors by m man in my lifetime, I'm sure. Um, but that man has got one huge presence and a lot of it is his very, very loud guffawing and uh, screaming with laughter, so that that's the only thing in the room. And that's what I chose to print. And I also think that photographing David Bailey was one of the funniest times I've ever had, because I went to his studio, which reminded me so much of the studios that I had assisted in, in London, wooden beamed and filing cabinets and a bit of a mess. But almost as soon as I started photographing him, he didn't really show discomfort, but I don't think he's used to the idea that he's not in control. And so he asked for a camera. And while I was photographing him, he started photographing me. But as I stepped back, as I had a longer lens than him, he had a wider lens, he stepped forward. And so we played this cat and mouse going around his studio, which I thought was, uh, and everybody else around was really funny. And he has a brilliant way of insulting you quite deeply, but you enjoy it. Dreamgirls was a project in Cuba, 
I wanted to go to Cuba and not take pictures of old cars and crumbling facades. And while I was there, discovered these women that weren't stigmatized like they are in the West. They were seen as a very necessary part of society, although highly illegal because of the Catholic society, I suppose, very Christian society. And that's who I decided to photograph. I always gravitate to the fringes. And if a person is quite mainstream, then maybe it's the fringes of feeling or the fringes of uh, mood. Or, uh, I'm always interested in that edgy, that edge where people are, I suppose, slightly left out. I was driving along that coastal stretch down near Dungeness in the south coast of England. All of those houses looked towards the sea and I was driving down at the time that people closed their curtains and as I was driving down I was looking in and it felt like movie frames. It felt I was looking into each house almost at the same speed of a movie film going through a projector and I decided to go back and with a van and really surreptitiously photograph into homes. Yeah, the idea of voyeurism, but also, again, human endeavor. I don't think that I'm influenced very much. In fact, I think far less than most by cinema. Uh, my pictures are really still, and they're about distilling. I'm very interested in capturing long amounts of time, long periods of time, encapsulated into one frame, but I've never been terribly interested in depicting too much of a story, which I think a film does. It's about that fragment that I'm interested in. And it was fragments of life that I was seeing into each house when I drove down that road. The fascination with the river when I photographed in China, the Yangtze, was not so much the river as it was a pathway through China for me, some artery that constrained me in some way. I think I could have expanded that to all of China but didn't want to. I wasn't interested in how deep it was or how cold it was. It was about um, the metaphor of constant change, which I think I probably only realized during the project, but the thing about the Yangtze is that unlike the Mississippi, let's say, or the Thames, which is only interesting and in the blood of the people that live right on its banks, the thing about the Yangtze that's so amazing is people as far as Beijing or, or, or Hong Kong have the Yangtze in their blood. It's their mother river, it's in their stories, it's, it's in their karma. I never wanted that work to look National Geographic-like. I never set out to make a documentary. I set out to see how I felt working in this country that was changing at such an unnatural pace, or unnatural for me. And I wanted to make work that was my work, using the iconography that turns me on within the place. It was never really to document, although any series of pictures that one makes of a place becomes document. But it's never the driver for me to to make documentary. I don't have a Cartier-Bresson book on my bookshelf. I'm far more interested in seeing myself mirrored in pictures. I'm interested in my inner landscape more than what I focus on within my pictures. Bodies was difficult to come up with a way, not so much to find a new way for form, but for a way for photography to photograph nudity that it wouldn't be assigned to the bookshelf of sex. I was trying to make sculpture. Gene Arp came to mind and I looked at his sculptures, these smooth white granite. And I was trying, I, I was thinking how that was sort of my starting point, and whenever I started making nudes, they always were sexualized. And I wanted to get away from that, and so the Gene Arp reference gave me the idea to, to, to get granite dust, which was the vehicle for so many sculptures that we all know. And I ground that up and put it with, um, with a body cream, and 
painted it on bodies at first very smoothly so you couldn't really see the brush stroke but you they became very white and somehow this barrier between the flesh and the camera lens let these pictures sit more as sculpture than than as human I just wanted them to be look at that shape that's a woman that's a woman curled that's a woman curled away why don't I see the face but it's all woman or it's all man it's not I wonder who that is. It was more, again, the human condition. As Bacon would have said, that the, the figure turned away holds so much more nourishment for the viewer than the person staring down the lens. There's been a Google satellite mapping the world that has found these areas of habitation Russia, Kazakhstan, that have never been mapped before. And I was really intrigued by the secrecy of that. That was the beginning of dust, finding, finding out what these cities were that had been kept so secret until the Cold War ended. What I found were these abandoned, vulnerable, to put a human feeling to these structures, to these areas. They were very metaphorical for me. Um, I wasn't quite sure why. I don't know why I was so attracted to the, to the ruin. I think I quite quickly felt that if these structures were people, they would be unclothed and out in the cold, very lonely. They felt quite beautiful yet discarded. When a, when a person walk, walks into the studio or I walk into a place of theirs, I think everything that's happened to me in my past comes into the room. And I think that person walking into the room brings everything that's happened to them. That almost showing on one's face and trusting that. So I think when you have a meeting with somebody like the Holocaust survivors, it works exactly in the same way as it would if, I, if it was Brad Pitt. It's all of my past and all of his past come together. And how we meet and tangle and work things out is the picture one is left with. So, of course, there's a... Everything that comes in my past is not only my past, but my father's past and grandfather's past. And the same with these survivors. So it was quite a... I'm not surprised they're, not, they're quite potent pictures. Formalizing the banal is really exciting. By witnessing, by bringing presence to what we don't look at um, is a very heightened sense in me. I'm very excited to be working on the Thames Estuary, my, my own river, and excited because I'm really at the beginning and still at that stage where I'm working very intuitively and slowly discovering what I'm interested in and reading and finding bits in books that I underline that teach me um, what it is that I find at the deepest level so interesting about water and slow-moving water especially. The Thames Estuary is of course a metaphor for time, for time, for dissolving, for the end of time, for um, vulnerability, for dissipation, for being absorbed into something else. But what I'm finding is that the slow moving water, the flattening out of the water, the coming to the end of a journey for the water, being absorbed into a much bigger whole, being the sea, are all what seem to be very important to me. I'm also very intrigued why I'm making such abstract work. And I realize that when I go there, you're not confronted with um, great beauty, except by great light sometimes, a great morning or a great evening, or 
but actually the river and the industry around it is not beautiful in the common use of the word. And I'm making this very abstract work and starting to realize that when I look at the water, it holds no history itself. It's moved on. It's only the idea or the writing about the water. If you look up to the land, you can see, oh, with that land in mind, this happened on the river. Conrad wrote, the boat was moored here, slaves were hung over there, pirates were, were sunk over here. All this rich history that has gone on can't be seen. The water holds no memory. And then I go, well, of course I'm making quite abstract work. That's, that's what it's about for me. I want to move on from how I photographed the Yangtze. I didn't want it to be that clear Germanic view. I wanted to move on. And I started thinking about the constraints of photography as they are right now in 2016. The, the constraints that we still think that a photograph has to be this thing that a lens focuses on in front of the camera. And why can't a photograph be like a Franz Klein or a Rothko? Why can't they be impressionistic? Do I need to not use a camera? Do I just take paper and expose it to the river and then process it? Or can I still use a camera and, and bring in more of me, more of the landscape of the person behind the lens? How, how do I tussle with that? How do I move this on? Why, why, why are we all so uh, romantically connected to this idea that it's an instant that a photograph always has to make? I think it's just so f much more exciting to work, to work from a place of not knowing. The excitement of learning through the, the endeavor of taking picture after picture is for me what it's all about.